Hi there, friends. I'll come in here with a quick note to let you know that the first global product owner summit organized by the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast is coming soon. To know more, check out the uh, bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's all one word, all lowercase. And uh, stick around to the end of the episode to know more. But for now, on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Team Tuesday this week with Mike Salagob. Hey, Mike, welcome back. Hey, Vasco, how are you doing? Uh, all good, all good. Um, so, Mike, we're going to talk about teams later on, but uh, Tuesday is also book day here on the podcast. So tell us a little bit more about uh, what is and also why you chose the book that most influenced you in your career as a Scrum Master. Yeah, so I actually have two. So the first one is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Uh, and the second one is Trillion Dollar Coach, um, which is the story of uh, Bill Campbell, famous Silicon Valley coach with Google and Apple. But these two books really um, have a special place in my heart, especially as a Scrum Master, because it's all about transparency, ownership, as well as teamwork. Right. A lot of us, we, we think of teamwork as this um, sports focused or kind of um, we, we and once we get into our careers, like there's no more teamwork. You sit in an office, you have your friends outside of work, but there's really great benefits to having an actual, you know, bringing teamwork characteristics to uh, your career, uh, especially for extreme ownership by Jocko. It's agile in a nutshell. I mean, from his days as a Navy SEAL, he really brings the core values and virtues of a scrum master to light. So it's take responsibility, give credit, setting high standards, believing in the why, um, admitting failure when you need to. And, And that's all kind of that teamwork aspect. If you're not doing that as a servant leader, you're never gonna have a great team. Um, and then it's something as simple, you know, keep it simple, you know, and uh, you really, when you're helping your boss, you're helping your team. So same thing with the product owner. The more you can help your product owner, the more that they can focus on all the, the, the stakeholders and they can focus on the product itself. So we can bring that back to the patients as well as focusing on the team, actually caring about the team actually asking each individual team member how their day is going, how's their home, how's their family life, all these things. And actually, you know, taking the time to focus on the person, not so much just the number on the um, employee board. Uh, And the second book is Billion Dollar Coach. It follows the uh, semi-biography of Bill Campbell, who was a, uh, a coach throughout all of the Google founders throughout its inception as well as with Steve Job at Apple. Um, he has a great quote in it. It says, Service for servant leadership, if you're a great manager, your team will make you a leader. They acclaim it, not you, which encom- encapsulates all of what being a scrum master is. You serve the team, whatever the content of what that team is making, you better make sure that your team has it, it, the the openness and they have the ability to be the best that they can be, but it's your job to help them see that. Whether it's a junior developer wanting to make that next step or a senior developer that's towards the end of their retirement, you should make sure that you are an essential person in their day-to-day life at work. Because when you remove the inconvenience of the workday for your team members, they will shine brighter than you can ever expect. And it's not to say something as simple as going and grabbing coffee, but asking them to go grab coffee and sitting with them and talking to them and hearing them and listening and providing feedback. Maybe it's getting them a birthday card. Maybe it's remembering that their their son or daughter just graduated college and that was a big accomplishment and they were super proud of it. Um, Just taking stock in their individual lives um, and that's what Billion Dollar Coach really taught me to do. And I've read it a couple of times now. And it's, you know, Bill Campbell just exuded that ultimate scrum master mentality. Absolutely. I'm sure a lot of inspiring quotes there for our uh, readers to go and explore. 100%. 
So, uh, of course, this coaching and the servant leadership that we exhibit, we do that to help our teams. But sometimes, and despite our best efforts, uh, sometimes even perhaps because of our best efforts, teams go the wrong way and uh, they start developing these behaviors and patterns that develop over time and become serious obstacles for them. So tell us the story of a team, tell us a little bit about the context, but then walk us through the steps. How did those, what were and what, how did those patterns of behavior develop over time and led to problems for that team? Yeah, so when I first started um, at one of my positions, there was definitely a conflict with the, um, the two team members and the roles and responsibilities and who had the authority um, who was the project manager, who was actually the program manager, and all these little inconvenience details. Just, it was just a very toxic workplace. And these two, these two people, I would have extensive one-on-ones with them. I would get coffee, I would get lunch, I would just try to find what makes them tick. And then individually, they were fantastic. They, the toxicity, would not even have, it would not even be in them for any reason. But when these two people were in the room together, it was as if a nuclear bomb went off. It was just uh, hellfire rain. So give so, us an example. So when we were, it, it, they would undermine each other during presentations. They would interrupt each other. And after countless times of me saying, okay, you know, let's give, it, it raise your hand on Microsoft Teams so you can see that little like hand motion or please wait till after the presentation. And they would just jump through every boundary that I would try to put up for both their sakes. And it wasn't just one or the other. And eventually it got to a point where we were, the interruption happened again. I said, hold up guys, we need 20 minutes. So I kicked everyone out of the meeting except those two. And I plainly asked what's going on. So then we spent another hour and a half and we went through every single issue that they had and they tried to jump out of the meeting and I had to pull them back in. And this was at a time where we were going into the office three times a week and now we're extensively remote. Um, And then the next time I saw both of them in person, we got into an office and you could tell it dissipated once they saw each other in person. It was just the heightened aspect of being remote and there was just tension between them. Oh, so when you said when they were in the same room, you meant when they were having a meeting, a remote meeting, and that was the context of that conflict was also the remote meeting, right? Correct. So I think it was just um, uh, looking back on it, a lot of tensions were high. There was, uh, they said, they said, she said, she said, all these different things. But when we got them into a room, it was, um, they both kind of, saw each other as human beings it wasn't oh you're just how how would you describe that like what what happened in that room in that physical room when they got together that told you okay they are starting to see each other as human beings like what were the things that you noticed okay this is what's happening so when they first got in um their fists were clenched they were holding their their um binders tightly they were not looking at each other they were huffing and puffing they were it just looked like it was right before a title fight for boxers you know they should have touched gloves and beat the crap out of each other but um then they started when you when they started talking you saw their their knuckles and their hands start opening up a little bit more and they would hear each other's voices in real time and in front of them and it all it, it, the the redness came out of their face, and they would it, it would kind of come back down to their natural complexion, and it was real. They they both kind of solely realized, oh, this is this is another person across from me. I am treating them with such vigor and it, it, I can't even think of the other way, anger. And it was they came to a nice cr- uh, ceasefire in that sense. And it just so happens that a couple of days later, they both were given kind of like their notices that they were going to be on separate trains after that. And I checked in with them a week after, and they kind of missed working with each other because they were both so good at their jobs. And they both tried to keep each other 
you know, iron sharpens iron. They both were just at each other's throats so much that it just elevated their, their standard of work. And they both missed working with each other. And now currently they are on the tra- same train and it, the problem's been alleviated. But it was for those first couple of weeks of working at my place, it was, it was definitely. So what, what do you think was the turning point? Like uh, what, what helped them to go from uh, this person doesn't know what they're doing to actually, you know, this person is a human being and, and they actually contribute a lot. Like what, what so, was the, the trigger to help them change their minds? Without getting into too much detail, it was both of them led a very lonely life in the sense of didn't have a lot of um, physical human contact. Uh, one worked remotely from a, um, a place upstate. The other one was just trying to make ends meet in a different state. And I think when they came together, they realized that they were just building up all this tension into each other and staring at the the, the business end of a, a rifle at each other when reality, it had nothing to do with the person on the other side. It was just, this is the person I want to hate. I'm going to hate them. And then the other person decided, all right, well, if you're going to hate me, I'm going to hate you. And they both focused every ounce of energy they had onto each other. And maybe that's just because we're now we're working in a remote world, but um, when they saw each other in person, you could tell that they saw each other as human beings. They saw each other as mothers. They saw each other as, um, you know, in, employees that start, it, it, they didn't see each other as just names on a Microsoft Teams. They saw each yeah, other. Or, or email addresses, right? Because a lot yeah. of this also gets, uh, I think, perpetuated and even amplified by the fact that we do a lot of written communication and uh, it's it's quite impossible to communicate the real intention of your words when it's written. I mean, it's hard even for professional writers, right? Oh, Let alone people that that don't actually write uh, uh, as a way to communicate more than a, a couple of maybe uh, emails a day or two emails a day or whatever. And uh, I was just thinking as you were describing the story that like, there was a, a similar story uh, with me many years ago when... I was communicating with someone and uh, the way they communicated led me to believe that they were being humorous, like not not in any way aggressive, but like humorous, like, you know, Mm -hmm. making light of the situation and and kind of joking about it. And when I communicated in the same tone, or I thought it was the same tone, they took it as an offense, right? And uh, when we met, when I later on uh, that day or the week after, when I met that person, then we both realized that actually we had both misunderstood what what was going on. I thought I was kind of following the same uh, mood and and just keeping the conversation light. And and he thought that I was making fun of of him and uh, not taking the, the situation seriously, right? Right. And and when you when you get face to face, then we start talking and say, "Oh, that's what you meant." I had no idea. Well, it's not. It's the tone of voice. It's how the person's facial reactions, how their body reactions are. It are they rolling their eyes when they say something jokingly about their boss? But then this person's actually taking it to heart. It, all those elements in this post-COVID remote world it is is just such a detriment. And if you can meet in person with people, meet in person. That or have your cameras on. I I know working from home, you want to stay in your PJs, you want to do all this, but have your cameras on. And like, yeah. you just, at least at least for a bit, right? Like you don't need to have the camera on for the whole meeting, but at least for a bit, or certain yeah. meetings like retrospectives, for example. Of course, anytime you want to convey human emotion, if you, you just need a status update, you can put that in the chat. If you want to say, hey, you know, Vasco, you. I need to talk to you about this. Don't do that over chat because there's so many ways and each person's different and they can take it there. And, and they're in a hurry. They don't have time to read properly. Like there's a yeah. lot of stuff that goes into that. All right. Hey, that was a great story. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Hi there, Agile friends. Thank you for sticking around. This year's first global summit dedicated to the product owner role in Scrum will have some amazing keynotes and two tracks filled with first-hand stories and experiences for product owners to learn more about that critical Scrum role. We'll have Roman Pichler, 
author and product expert who will be answering your questions and sharing the most important aspects of the product or the role. We'll also have Colleen Johnson talking about why roadmaps are probably making your life much harder than it needs to be and uh, what to do instead. This talk was quite a success in Agile Online Summit 2022 and Colleen has learned some new tricks, tools, techniques that she will share with us when it comes to roadmaps for the product on a roll. And we will also have Henrik Nibery, author of Scrum and Kanban from the Trenches, as well as one of the creators of the Spotify model. So come in and listen to his stories. And uh, we'll also have, of course, two tracks with uh, many more sessions and even some live sessions. The two tracks will cover practices every product owner should know, uh, where we'll be hosting conversations on topics that product owners need to be familiar with, like product re backlog refinement, planning, and much more. The second track will be on metrics, measuring product and personal success as a product owner. As product owners, it's crucial to have a clear understanding of what are the metrics that drive success for us and, of course, also for the products and businesses that we work with. And we need to continuously measure and optimize those metrics. So in this track, we'll be sharing what's working and what's not in the area of managing success for product owners. We will also have the opportunity to network with our peers. It's a network event, of course. So get your tickets and join our Slack. Go to uh, bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's all one word, all lowercase. As always, we will have free tickets and VIP tickets, which will give you long-term access to the content of this summit. So check them out at bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. All lowercase, all one word. I'll see you on the summit floor. Tuesday is team day here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. But tomorrow we talk about something that goes beyond the work we do with the teams. We will talk about how to lead change and what our guests have learned from leading and participating in change programs during their career. See you tomorrow. <laughs>